Welcome to Ruins and Haunting Heritage. My name is Dr. April Besaw. I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Vassar College, and this is my archaeology seminar for the fall 2020 semester. In this lecture, we're going to cover chapters 9 and 10 of Blurring Timescapes, Subverting Erasure. In the last video, we ended with chapter 8, which was a uh, zine comic version chapter of a uh, ghost story of Lansing, Michigan. And chapter 9, uh, Traumascapes, Progress, and the Erasure of the Past by Sarah Surface Evans, is also about Lansing, Michigan. And it's not that Lansing, Michigan is the most haunted uh, city in the United States or the world. It's uh, that this place is uh, where both of these uh, women uh, live and work. And therefore, um, it gives us an opportunity to see how two different academics who are both interested in ghost stories have very, very different stories to tell. So Sarah Surface Evans begins with this um, on page 149. By their very nature, cityscapes are haunted landscapes. Cities are the accumulation of memories, lives, and the assorted material culture left behind by many generations, both inhabitants and visitors. This complex accumulation of artifacts, memories, and material culture is what archaeologists would refer to as a palimpsest, a thing with many layers or stories beneath the surface. The traces of those who came before us are often quite literally buried beneath our feet to be remembered or forgotten. So this is how archaeology is memory work. So from an arrowhead found in a farmer's field to an Egyptian tomb, what is left of the lives of our predecessors can be forgotten by time or remembered by archaeologists or anyone who encounters those lingering material remains and then tells stories about them. Archaeologists are just one of the kinds of careers um, and one of the kinds of people who make a career out of finding the debris of the lives of people we never met and trying to make sense of it all. Sarah Surface Evans says, in a sense, ghosts can only exist because of the living. Our minds, memories, and artifacts act as the repository for what happened or existed in the past. So I would say that a written down understanding of the long expanse of the human past exists mainly because of archeologists, the written down version. Because without us, um, ghost stories may be the only way to speak of these arrowheads and tombs, but also of sidewalks that lead to nowhere. We are told that if something from the past is important, there would be a book about it. But historians focus on written records, not on the things that we accumulate and leave behind unintentionally, or the places that become erased by politicians and their pens that causes a loss to a community deprived of their once special place. So that is what Sarah's chapter is about, how people in power can take away community spaces from people who are not in power. She calls this the specters of gentrification, a specific type of haunting that is created by and perpetuates trauma. So my ghost story of this chapter is a bit longer than the others because I was inspired to do a little sleuthing of my own and uncover some additional bits. Uh, I lived in Michigan for a while and, and visited Lansing several times. So this is my story inspired by Sarah Surface Evans' Traumascapes, Progress, and the Erasure of Past. One of the most haunting places in Lansing, Michigan, is the city's new power substation. 
Those who follow the paranormal know that ghosts can feed off electricity. Here, there is plenty to go around, and the power station's ghosts have a right to all that energy. This place was once the home of a Michigan Supreme Court Justice, Edward Cahill. Justice Cahill is best remembered for leading Michigan's first African-American infantry unit during the Civil War and for an 1890 court decision that prohibited racial discrimination in the state's public spaces. He was a man of fairness and equality, and those are characteristics that Lansing's residents cherish. After Cahill's death, a neighbor and later president of the REO Motor Company, a man named Richard Scott, transformed Cahill's former home into a sunken garden. In the 1960s, Scott Garden became city property to be enjoyed by all. This location provided the neighboring African-American communities with much needed green space, but its beauty attracted residents from all over the city. Many birthdays, graduations, and weddings were marked with a photo of loved ones at Scott Garden. Changes to the garden came in 1978 when the city moved a historic house to the park. This house was once the home of Orrin Jensen, eulogized as one of Lansing's oldest and best known citizens. He spent 48 of his 72 years in Lansing, arriving at his new home on Christmas day after walking most of the way from Jackson, Michigan. Uncle Jen was a collector of things, especially anything relevant to the history of Michigan. Some of his collections can still be found in the state library. Uncle Jen would have been pleased to have his home relocated to Justice Cahill's property, but he's surely not pleased with what happened next. Intended to serve as a community center, the house was not supported by all, and it fell into disrepair. In retrospect, the decline should have been a warning of what was to come. With the power station's construction, Uncle Jen's house and the Scott Garden were demolished. Chainsaws took down several trees that were likely just saplings when Cahill supported racial equality in Michigan's public spaces. Some say the wood from those trees was used to create a wall that encircles the power plant, adding insult to injury. The wall is often adorned by public art but not all the works turn out as the artist planned. The energy that flows here reminds us that Lansing should be a city for all. So Sarah's story is specific to Lansing, but a universal one at the same time. We can't go home again. Places are always changing. But when the places that help define a community are lost, the community suffers. Sarah says, on page 154. In one aspect, the sense of haunting prevents erasure, even when some stories are actively erased by structural oppression and power. Yet there is violence in forgetting. Once communities lose their physical connection to the past, their identities through gentrification and demolition, trauma becomes embedded in the landscape. Extra burdens are placed on those who are left to do the work of remembering, especially if that remembering is a narrative of the past that is different from that of those in power. So those who destroy or destroyed the community's place are often the same people who say that ghost stories and stories in general are of little value. So don't add insult to injury. Listen and document the stories of place, for there are human experiences embedded in them, or they would not be told and would not be repeated in one form or another. On page 164, Sarah says, we must acknowledge that the past is contested. Not all voices are heard equally because social inequality forces some stories to be forgotten or hidden. It is in this contested experience and traumatic past that some ghosts are manifested. In the last chapter uh, in Blurring Timescapes, or the last chapter before the epilogue that contains my ghost tour of the book, 
um, is Brigitte Bechtold's Brickwork, Capitalism, Collective Memory, and the Commons. So I'll start off with, with my ghost story inspired by Brigitte's chapter first. The modest brick home at 501 Cabot Way, South Pittsburgh, is an anachronism. In this densely populated neighborhood, fine workmanship is no longer as important as return on investment. Newer homes are built so close to the road that visitors have to turn sideways to climb the entry stairs. Almost every square inch of the neighborhood is paved in asphalt. Children play inside their generic homes and neighbors come and go with such frequency that relationships between them are rare. The corner inhabited by 501 Cabot Way includes a hand-laid brick building alongside a cobblestone road. To build this home, workers placed each brick and stone with care to ensure it was straight and true. Doors and windows were adorned by offsetting a row or turning a few bricks on their side. There is a defiance in this corner, a refusal to become something new just for the sake of newness. Yet some want this place torn down and paved over. There is money to be made in a bigger and more modern home. Plus, cobbled streets are noisy. Every passing car is announced by the gentle rumble of its tires over the uneven surface. But that rumble belongs here. It recalls the sounds that created this neighborhood, the slurping up of a trowel full of mortar, the scraping of that mortar onto a brick, and the pat-pat-patting of it all into place. Slurp, scrape, pat, and rumble. That soundtrack of the community has been replaced by the constant beep-beep-beeping of heavy machinery and car alarms, the hum of central heating and air conditioning units, and the occasional police or ambulance siren. The spirit of South Pittsburgh is now inhuman. I think that one of the ideas that Brigitte brings to the volume is that even the small bits that we make our homes and lives out of, like bricks, have a human story attached to their production. Late modernity has removed us from seeing and experiencing the manufacturing process of all that we rush to consume. Just like the fact that we want our food to be so cheap that farmers can't afford to farm, we want all of our stuff to be meaningless so we can buy, sell, and dispose of it without much thought. And without much thought, to those whose lives were spent creating it. Brigitte says that capitalist time has the effect of leapfrogging over points in chronological time. Large capitalist projects are heralded while efforts of individual workers are forgotten. This disruption of personal histories and collective memories of communities of workers and their families adds to alienation in the capitalist world. This sense of alienation is the source of haunting. That was a quote from Brigitte from page 182. So that brings us straight back into the book After Modernity, Archaeological Approaches to the Contemporary Past by Harrison and Schofield, that it isn't that the past is not interesting. It isn't that the past isn't meaningful. It's that we are taught to consume and not care about who we impact as long as we succeed in the game of life by having more toys and newer houses and bigger and bigger and bigger houses and more and more and more toys that we don't have time to think about our impacts on each other and on the planet. And maybe that's part of that crisis called climate change that we refuse to pay attention to. That because we build bigger and bigger houses and we throw away more and more things and we consume more and more, that that's why the planet can't sustain us anymore. 